let's try to personalize this for yourself. I know we always want to go to an integrative or functional medicine doctor who can personalize the care for ourselves, but I'm going to challenge that. I think if we have discussions like this and I give you information that makes sense and that it's actionable and you as a, a person who's not a trained healthcare professional um, can understand, I think you can start personalizing this for yourself. So let's think about our own personal experience with fatigue. I want you to think about when we're trying to figure out like what caused this fatigue, what may have, um, you know, allowed this to brew under the surface. And for many of us, it is MS, but let's kind of go a little bit deeper. What was happening in your life prior to the onset of fatigue in the previous month, six months, year, years, you know, was there a lot of stress? Were you working really hard and doing too many things? Um, was there an illness? Was there an MS diagnosis? So there's often a cause if you can kind of think back. And sometimes I have my patients make a timeline where they go from like birth to present. They put in all their important life events and um, they just try to um, drop in when different symptoms came in. And it helps you kind of see things more holistically. And then if you ever make one of those, take it to your doctor and hopefully they'll care to see sort of the progression of your condition and how things have happened. Okay, speed of onset. How fast did your um, fatigue come on? Was it over a short period of time, like a few days or it took a few weeks? Or did it just creep up on you so slowly that you really don't know when it happened? Okay. And the reason that's important is that if it onset quicker, where you're like, yeah, I do remember in May of 2020, when people start giving me dates, that's like a big clue to me. They're like, oh yeah, something happened. I don't know what it was. May of 2020, all of a sudden, I just wasn't myself anymore. I couldn't do the things I used to be able to do. This points to something like an infection. Um, you know, uh, it could be a viral infection, could be a, a bacterial infection. Um, it could be due to an injury. Maybe you got injured working out or doing exercise. Maybe you were in a car accident. Maybe it was during pregnancy or during labor, labor and delivery. So if you're, you know, think about that. Does, did, can you sort of pinpoint how fast your fatigue came on? It may be one of these reasons that could be your underlying reason. So for example, people with chronic fatigue syndrome um, oftentimes will say, you know, I was traveling. I got really bad diarrhea. I came home. I was never the same. I just had fatigue. Bacterial infections can do that. So how do we treat that person's fatigue? Well, you, you could give them stimulants and make them feel good for a short period of time, but that's not really the long-term answer. You um, try to make sure if it was a gastroenteritis, Let's support the gut. Let's build up the microbiome. Let's figure out how we can reverse the thing that caused this to happen. And then um, if your um, onset of fatigue was slower, it may point to some of these causes. Maybe it was due to changes in hormones. Maybe it was due to menopause, for example, just changes that happened, or maybe stress changed your hormones. And that was the cause. Could be nutritional, like chronically eating um, convenience food or foods that just don't nourish your body and you don't have the building blocks or eating foods that are um, you're, you've developed sensitivities to. Um, stress can do it. Fungal infections tend to be really sneaky. They take a long time to manifest. And also autoimmunity, um, you know, MS, you know, the, the fatigue doesn't like just fall on your head all of a sudden just sneaks up on you. You can't quite pinpoint how it happened, but here you are. And now you've got this thing that you've got to figure out. So this is why I ask you to think about the speed of onset. And then it's really important to figure out what makes you feel better and what makes you feel worse. And the obvious thing here is do more of the things that make you feel better and do less of the things that make you feel worse. And I know this sounds really common sense, but like if exercise makes you feel better, you've got to start doing more exercise, right? But um, this may also be a clue as to what may be behind your reason for fatigue. And also think about your pattern of fatigue over time. Is it like up and down all the time? Has it been getting steadily worse, steadily better, or 
totally unpredictable um, because I think people who struggle with fatigue, as with all of us, we all have just short-term memory. We forget that we have made progress um, and sometimes progress is slow, but it's still progress. I have this lovely patient who um, desperately wanted to walk long distances. And when we started working together, she would say, I walked, I said, how much, how long do you walk? And she'd say two houses. And that's all she could do because then she'd be wiped out. So over time, she would say, I'm walking 10 houses. I'm walking half a mile. And then, you know, then she was telling me she's walking two miles. And, and then I remember she got COVID. She had a big setback and she was back to walking 10 houses again. But she forgot that she had been, you know, worked her way up to two miles a day. So it's good to keep a diary just an easy diary of what you're doing. So you can start kind of seeing your fatigue over time, or you can just rate your fatigue um, over time. But because I think sometimes we do make progress with fatigue, but we don't see it because it's slow. Okay, if you have fatigue, hopefully your doctor has done these things to you. Hopefully they've ruled out anemia, low red blood cells, or low hemoglobin, okay? There's many reasons for this, um, but it should be ruled out. And I find that when I see patients with fatigue, sometimes they are anemic and sometimes they have low iron and nobody's checked. I'm not a smart doctor, but I have lists that I go through because I want to make sure that if there are easy reversible causes, I'd like to start there, right? Low hanging fruit first. Um, Low, and you know, people who are also um, are vegetarian or vegan are at risk of being low in iron and low in B12. B12 is really important for energy production. So you wanna make sure your B12 level is somewhere between 500 to 1000, okay? Um, thyroid problems, right? Let's make sure your thyroid is ticking really nice and well. Um, so uh, it's not really crucial that your doctor checks the entire thyroid panel, but a TSH and a free T4 is a good place to start. I like TSH between one to two, um, even though the range goes from 0.4 to four. And a free T4, if it's like close to 1.3, I'm really excited about that. Now, if your numbers are far from that, I would look at patterns. I would like repeat another set of thyroid labs in, you know, three to six months to see what those numbers are doing. Because one set of numbers in, in time isn't the entire story. I would also ask your doctors to check for antibodies against the thyroid. There's two different antibodies, antithyroglobulin antibody, anti-TPO antibodies, okay? Anti-thyroglobulin and anti-TPO. So one of the most common autoimmune diseases is Hashimoto's disease um, worldwide. So antibodies against the thyroid. And guess what? Because we have proven we are good at getting an autoimmune disease, it means that we're good at getting other autoimmune diseases, unfortunately. So the more we can do to help quiet down the autoimmunity, get the immune system to behave a little bit better, um, the less chance that we can start building on antibodies to other things. Make sure your blood sugars are okay. Um, elevated blood sugars can also lead to fatigue. So, um, But also really good tight blood sugar is important for MS because anytime blood sugar gets a little wacky, starts like going up a little bit, um, you just basically make inflammation. And that's the last thing any of us need. Okay, and then there's sleep apnea, of course, right? Um, better diagnosed in older men who are overweight, but you know, oftentimes women who are younger and smaller don't get diagnosed. They get, you know, nobody picks it up in them. So if you're not sure if you have sleep apnea and you don't have to be overweight to have sleep apnea, but it is a weight is a risk factor. Um, Ask somebody who observes you sleeping, do you stop breathing at night, right? Do you take a few short breaths? They get successively shorter and shorter, and then you kind of pause, and then you wake up and take a bigger breath, and then you go into doing that pattern again. Just not snoring is not enough to say you don't have sleep apnea. And um, if nobody observes you breathing, you can take 
your voice memos on your phone before you go to bed, hit start. And when you wake up in the morning, hopefully eight to nine hours later, you listen to it and see if you sort of stop breathing throughout the night. This is my poor man's test for sleep apnea. Um, this is not a way to diagnose you. You do need to get go to your doctor and get a sleep study done. Um, sometimes they start with a home sleep study and then they'll do one in the lab. But it's really important because um, I think we're all on the same page when I say oxygen is important, right? And we don't want your oxygen, your tissues to starve of oxygen overnight. Okay, so I keep talking about underlying imbalances behind fatigue. Like, what the heck does that mean, right? Let's talk about root causes. What does that mean? Okay, so if you have fatigue, what are different things going on in the body that can produce fatigue? Okay, let's talk about those things. Ooh, this is a big one. Uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. So the mitochondria are the parts of the cell that produce energy for us. And every cell has hundreds, if not thousands of these little tiny units that pump out ATP molecules. When these mitochondria get damaged and they don't work well, or they shrink in numbers, we can't produce enough energy. And that we call fatigue. Okay. So we want to make sure we have healthy mitochondria. Think Dr. Walls here. Doesn't she always talk about mitochondria? So mitochondria play a really important role in um, MS. Um, gastrointestinal imbalance. So um, leaky gut is something we talk a lot about in West, in um, holistic medicine, integrative and functional medicine. So if you don't have a good tight lining of your GI tract, um, that may lead to fatigue, also, um, you know, disruption of your gut microbiome. So how do we get th this system to work better, right? Uh, there are ways of putting things into practice um, to help boost gut health. And I've actually just recently developed a program for this. So I'll be talking about that towards the end. Hormone imbalances can lead to fatigue. So of course, we always think about th low thyroid and fatigue and low energy, but you know, the hormones don't work together, work in isolation. They all work together. They modify each other. They change each other's receptor numbers. So think about, here's, I'll tell you a story. Like, for example, let's say you are chronically stressed your body's gonna respond by pumping out cortisol from your adrenal glands. There's one adrenal gland on top of each kidney. And so that's how we keep up with that stress demand. Then um, we have this, this high number of, a high amount of cortisol flooding our system and we're, we're compensating. But here's what also happens downstream. High cortisol inhibits thyroid. So if you have a thyroid problem, which I wouldn't be surprised, there's probably like a third of us in here, if not more that have a thyroid issue. Um, if our thyroids aren't working as well, how about we work upstream an underlying cause by reducing stress to reduce cortisol so that thyroid can function better, right? So that was just one example of a hormone imbalance contributing to fatigue. And then, of course, the immune system getting wacky and causing too much inflammation. Um, this is very much connected to fatigue. And if I can, again, use the model of chronic fatigue syndrome, like people with chronic fatigue syndrome actually have a lot of inflammation up in the brain. And, and um, as a result, they are quite fatigued. Okay, so why are these systems breaking down? Why are the mitochondria not working? Why is the gut dysfunctioning? Why are the hormones out of, out of balance? Well, it's, it could be because of infections, COVID or EBV or any other really uh, viral infection, bacterial fungal infection, toxic exposures in the environment. There's many things we can't influence. And, and not get exposed to because they're just in the environment, but there is so much we can influence. So we're going to focus on that, um, you know, in, in future discussions, uh, trauma, emotional trauma, physical trauma can cause your mitochondria, your gut, your hormones to go out of balance as can stress. 
poor nutrition, lack of sleep, um, lack of exercise, all of these things can cause these systems to break down. So on this list, there are things you can influence and things you have um, less influence over. So what do we do? We talk about the things that we can influence. Uh, and I want to also just go circle back on the mitochondria because they're so important. You know, today somebody in, in one of my groups at Stanford asked, how do I go get a test to see if my mitochondria are working? We do have some tests, but they're not great. And they're probably very expensive. And I've never run them for, for those reasons. So here are some symptoms that can point to mitochondrial dysfunction where we know we got to work on your mitochondria. Fatigue, mood changes and anxiety, headaches, migraines, pain, fibromyalgia, and vague neurologic symptoms. Maybe something like tinnitus, or you have some visual thing that your neurologist says to you, there's nothing there. Everything is fine on your exam. Your MRIs are fine. It just is, you know, let's just watch it. If, if you are hitting on a lot of these bullet points here, we need to talk about mitochondria and how we can optimize that for you, okay? So you don't need to go out and get fancy tests. If anything, I'd rather you spend the money on the things that are going to help you just fix your mitochondria, right? Like really good, high-quality plant-based foods. 